Hello, it's Jessica Okoro. Welcome to the Stepping Into STEM podcast. We are still on a mission to expose a million of you to the STEM industry by 2023. Today, our special guest is Anne-Marie Campion. She's the lead for the early careers across all programs, including graduates, undergraduates, and apprentices at Jangua Land Rover. Anne-Marie has had a long career in early careers and has worked in various student recruitment roles, including big organizations such as Deloitte and HSBC Emerging Talent Team. She is someone that knows her stuff. Thanks for joining us, Anne-Marie. Hey, you're welcome. So um, we're going to dive in with the icebreaker, um, which is not going to be really related to the topic that we're talking about. It's going to be a bit random. So if you could choose one musician to listen to for the rest of your life, who would it be? Uh, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, what's your favourite song? What's your favourite uh, song? I kind of like this one of his new album, which is called um, Crossing the Rubicon. And that is my favourite track. I, I kind of, I grew up with Bob Dylan because my, one of my older, I've got three older brothers and one of my older brothers is just a total Bob Dylan freak, basically, just, just completely <laughs> obsessed with Bob Dylan. So I grew up with it and I've gone through phases of I hate it, it's rubbish, I, it's not it's not boppy enough, you know, it depends how old I've been that I've either liked it or not liked it. But I've yeah. really got back into Bob Dylan in the last couple of years and I've, I've been going back over a lot of his albums and, and his, his new album, which I just think is brilliant. And that is my current favourite Bob Dylan track. But ask me in another month and I'll probably choose something else. But yeah, I'd say Bob Dylan. <laughs> Bob Dylan for the musician. If you could pick one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? I'd go for Thai food. Ooh, Thai. Okay, my last icebreaker question. If you could live anywhere else in the world right now, where would it be? I would live in the south of France. Ooh, en français. Si vous play. Oui. That's all I know in French. That's all I know. So, um, we're going to be talking about Jaguar Land Rover. I'm going to call it JLR just to shorten it and make it a bit easier. Is that okay? Yep, that is absolutely um, fine. And I'm going to start off with stepping into JLR as our first <laughs> segment. Um, what STEM roles slash apprenticeships are available at J JLR? Well, pretty much everything in JLR um, takes people from STEM, from STEM backgrounds from uh, either STEM A-levels, GCSEs, degrees. Um, the vast majority of our roles are across engineering and manufacturing, um, and we need STEM backgrounds to do those roles. They're different roles, but we still need people with STEM backgrounds. Um, there are a few of our roles uh, which are kind of a bit more open on degree background or A-level background, but the vast majority, you need your maths, you need your science, you need your IT, variants of that, engineering, electronics, but STEM is absolutely critical to us and critical to our future. So everything, everything that we do requires STEM. So could you give me some titles of some of the roles that, yeah, that sure. are available? So I'll just give you some examples. So we've got two flagship degree apprenticeship programs, which is a post A-level program that we have. Uh, one's called Digital Technology Solutions. The other one's called Applied Professional Engineer. One, okay. as you can imagine, is more on digitalization and coding and software engineering. The other is on more on the electrical controls engineering. They're both absolutely fundamental to our business. We need lots of people. We're recruiting around 80 this year to do those apprenticeships. They yeah. require STEM A-levels. Undergraduates, software engineers, electronics and integrated systems engineers, um, hardware and mechatronics engineers, propulsion engineers, um, manufacturing engineering. They're all roles within our engineering and manufacturing functions. We need people with STEM A levels and then having gone on to do a very, very and various, sorry, engineering degrees. Um, oh, that makes sense. That's huge. quite varied. Yeah, yeah it's very pretty varied. varied. But I like that it's varied because it means that you can, you can know the brand you know, having seen the cars drive around and other products that um, the brand has and kind of go on the website and see what's suited to you based on what you've done for your A-levels or done at university. Yeah. As a candidate, what do you think they need to have asset-wise with regards to personality type, 
um, skill sets for them to apply for an apprenticeship or every level entry level role? Okay, well, I think it does depend on what you're applying for. So I think if you're taking an apprenticeship, that's all about potential. So we, we don't restrict it, obviously, to people who are still at school. Um, you could have left school and gone on to do some other things. You could have done you could have done on many other things and then still come into an apprenticeship. But the majority of people who start an apprenticeship are either coming straight out of GCSEs, so they're only out of year 11, or they're coming out of year 13 with A-levels. So they could basically do almost absolutely anything. I mean, they, they could come to Jaguar Land Rover, they could go to other organisations, they could go to university, they could just take their backpack and go abroad for years, who knows? So that's all about potential. Um, when it comes to the engineers coming in at graduate level, I'd say one of the most telling things that our, one of my colleagues in the engineering field said the other day on a similar sort of podcast or interactive event with some of our incoming graduates, he said, you know, we're recruiting, we're recruiting you because you know stuff we don't. And that's key. Wow. People at university are breaking boundaries. You know, they are really just got that they're at the cutting edge of um, engineering technology and they will bring to our business a new knowledge that even if people have been in our business for 10 or 20 years they don't really have so yeah it's 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 a it's a combination you need to have motivation you need to want to learn however however much you already know you still need to want to learn um and you need to be able to show that you are flexible and adaptable and open-minded because the automotive industry in 2021 is phenomenally different from how it was in 2001 and it will be completely different in 2031 so you See, that's so interesting that's yeah. i mean what i find quite interesting is the fact that normally when you're when you're undergrad or you're coming in at an entry level role you assume that you don't have the right skill sets and you normally have confidence issues and you think maybe i'm not good enough to work here and you suffer with this imposter syndrome but from what you've just said they, I mean, we need, as an organization, we need you and we want your expertise and we want your point of view and you're actually coming in as an asset. I love that. I really exactly. love that. It, it, you, yeah, don't, don't be frightened of the fact that you will come in and contribute from day one because you will in different ways, but you will absolutely contribute from day one. And it is win-win because you have the chance to grow and develop both personally and professionally and you have the chance to learn from the best in the industry. They may not know some of the nuances about the new world of technology and engineering that you do from your academic studies, but they have been market leaders and leading experts in this industry for many years. And so you will learn so much from them. So as I say, on both sides of the coin, it's just a totally beneficial career choice. Yeah, I love that. And if I could ask, what's the interview process like? The standard well, interview process. Okay, well at the moment there isn't one because because of coronavirus we've had to change everything. So this year all of our assessments are taking place over Teams basically. Um, so quite a simple platform, but it was really important to us to have a platform that was accessible to all because one of the things I'm really mindful of, particularly in the apprentice space, which is a huge number of our recruits, is not everyone has access to great technology. Not everyone has sort of uh, like MacBooks all over their room. They're living in their mum and dad's house or their carer's house and they just have whatever technology is, is available to them. So it's sometimes really, just a phone. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. sometimes just a really basic phone that doesn't even have camera functionality. So yeah. we were really mindful of the fact that we, we needed to convert our exercises, our interview process, as it were, to go onto Teams, but that it needed to work on Teams. Going no, forward, I love that. I hope that we will have a blended approach where we can still use some virtual um, platform of Teams typically because that's quick and it's easy and it saves people getting up and having to travel and, and all the other things and it means it can fit in better with school and university. Um, but I think it is important for, for us, but more important for candidates to just see where they'd be working to actually, you know, just sort of sense the vibe really of the organisation. Uh, and, and meet some of the people that, you know, have a look around. Would I like to work here? Would I feel comfortable in here? Would, would, do I feel I would belong here? So that would be really important. But going forward, who knows? But that is my, my intention would be to have a more blended approach. But I think from the candidate's point of view, your interview process needs to test you in different ways. 
but it yep. really needs to demonstrate to us what is your potential because for all of early careers that is the most important thing yep i agree with that and i love that you've made it very much accessible to larger you know audiences who may not have the resources and yeah. may feel a bit nervous about trying to you know join this process not having everything that they assume they need yeah um, and go on so no. you going to say something Anne? no it's just going to say one thing really st- maybe this all you know completely hit home the other day we were doing an insight event about for people who were coming into our programs this year or coming on to assessments for our programs and we've been telling them what they had to do and he goes oh no what's going to happen like because my little brother is like always running around the house he's always making a noise what if he runs into my camera what if you hear him in the background and it just illustrates this is really difficult for people and they're really worried about will we be judging their home environment will we be judging what what technology they've got and so it's really important for students to recognize that everybody is treated fairly in our organization and everybody has has the equal chance to, to shine but it has really highlighted sort of inequalities and and disadvantage and and we're determined to make sure that people don't feel that's ever a factor so Anne Marie, are there any red flags that would give you an insight or a hint that a candidate may not be a, a good fit for JLR? Yes, um, lots. Um, it's difficult to to describe them all. I mean, I think in terms of motivation, it's really understanding the role that you've applied for. And whilst we don't, you don't have to have already done the role. Like I said, it's all about potential. You do have to appreciate what the role is. So if you're coming in as a level three apprentice, and that was a this meeting I had just before uh, came came to talk to you, um, bringing people in as electrical fitters, that is a very specific job. It, yes, you are working in a plant in a in a prestige car company, but you're not really building cars. You are doing stuff that helps other people build cars. So it, it's illustrative of the fact that every single program within Jaguar Land Rover is different and I would say candidates who just basically just say I just want to work for Jaguar Land Rover I don't care what I do that's a red flag because you do need to know what you want to do Um, a red flag is also I think being um, disrespectful of your assessor you know you have that sometimes where people are um, just like trying to rail rail roughshod over someone and not listen so I think listening to the question, making sure that you answer the question that you've been asked is critical yep. and knowing what you've applied for. Okay, so sometimes I can imagine someone being very nervous to the point that they've watched so many interview type questions <laughs> and videos on YouTube. So they kind of have an idea as to what the assessor's going to ask. So they're jumping to answer the questions before. Does that sometimes come across disrespectful? respectful would you say based on what you just said no not nervousness no absolutely no problems with that and again just on the meeting just now it's like we were talking about why they're a little bit nervous I don't mind nervousness you know you're not here to be an entertainer you don't need to be the sort of star of the show and all extrovert and all bells and whistles that's that's not what it's about it's about listening to your assessor taking the time you know mo- most assessments i wouldn't say all but certainly assessments at jaguar land rover but most assessments are there to get the best out of you they're not there to catch you out so take your time breathe um, take a drink of water listen to the question and then begin to answer calmly in the best way that you can because you don't need to be as i say the life and soul of the party you don't need to be an extrovert but you do need to listen to your assessor and appreciate that they are the experts in the industry they're asking you the questions for good reason so I, when i said disrespectful it's about just trying to seize the interview and just do your own thing that is not going to oh, okay well. So them, them trying to drive the interview and, and yeah. own the, the whole conversation. I understand. Exactly. And um, is there like an age limit to apply for your entry level roles? No. Uh, you, there's an entry requirement, but it's not an age. Or, and there's no cap. Okay. What well, about apprenticeships? Yep, no cap on that either. Um, the oh, wow. the in Back in the day, and I don't know quite what, time, what year that changed, but back in the day, there used to be a limit, an age limit, after which you could not draw down from the apprentice levy as a as an employer, um, and uh, without going into masses of detail on the levy. So, go, go companies pay a proportion of their payroll as taxation, 
uh, over to the Exchequer and they can draw back from that if they are um, employing apprentices and delivering apprenticeship programmes. So it's, it's beneficial because obviously it becomes a, a, a payback, as, as it were, to the tax that you've already paid. Um, and that used to be a cut off. <clears throat> so you couldn't draw down on that if the person who was doing the apprenticeship was over the age of 21, I think. But that long since went several years ago. And now there's absolutely no age limit at all. That's very encouraging um, because that opens the whole diversity space yeah, and completely. ensuring there's more. Yeah, more opportunities for more people. Um, and are there are there limited spaces for these roles? I mean, you did mention there was 80 spaces. What if you met 82 people that were all phenomenal? Would, would there be, you know, a, a slide on that? Um, bizarrely, probably not on the, the example that I just gave, because that example that I gave is the degree apprenticeship programme. So as well as Jaguar Land Rover and the candidate, there is also the education provider, which in our case okay. is Warwick University. So when we've um, set the course up, as it were, you've also set it up for a specific cohort size and the, um, the academic staff for that degree programme will be correlated to the cohort group. So it would be unlikely that you could just add people because that might not be accommodated by the education provider. It might, but there would be that limitation. Um, certainly if we're looking at, say, for example, undergrads, which is for placements, industrial placements with us, that would be much more feasible. Like, oh, we thought we only wanted 10 undergraduates on placement. We've seen 11 people who were just absolutely brilliant. Well, then, yeah, we could take an extra person. But it, the, the apprenticeships are just slightly more different because, as I say, you've got another stakeholder to consider. So you were just talking about Warwick University as your educational partner. Could you just give us some insight into the, the layout of being at a university and being employed by JLR? Because that sounds super bizarre. I mean, when I was at university, I was just about managing being on the basketball team and studying. So I don't know how someone could fit a full time job into that as well. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's a four year programme. Um, and well, both of our degree programmes are four year programmes and you get a BSc at the end of that four years. So you get a degree just as if you had gone to that university as an undergraduate, but it is a completely different life. Uh, you have periods of time at university, but you're pr first and foremost, you're an employee. So you do not have the student lifestyle that an undergraduate ha would have. You have the opportunity to use the facilities on Warwick University campus and to get involved in teams, for example, or any kind of events or societies that, that you are interested in. But you would absolutely have to fit that around your day job and you're contracted to a proper day job. So it's full time. So it's, it is very, very different. You've got to be incredibly motivated and very, very disciplined because you've got to deliver your job and you've got to manage to get your degree studies in as well. You clearly have time allocated to your studies, but you have to be a fantastic time management person to achieve that degree. But if you do, well, brilliant, because you've got a career that's, that's on takeoff. You've had a degree that you haven't had to pay for. Um, and you've got an apprenticeship. So you've got a fantastic marketable qualification, qualifications, sorry, to then yeah. continue your career. But it's very hard work. See that kind of, for me, I'm thinking about being 18 years old or, you know, 17 years old. Uh, Cause I mean, I think you said it could start off from when you finish your A-levels, am I correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, being at that age, I don't know if I would have been able to handle the, I'm working full time while studying and, you know, trying to maintain a normal young person's life. I, I would have felt that quite overwhelming. Is there support for that transition? Yeah, I mean, the advantage that we have at Jaguar Land Rover is that you are in a quite significant cohort group size in and of itself. So you're not just one person who's the sort yeah. of the odd one out doing a degree the apprenticeship. Community. You're one of 40. So you've, okay. got your, you've got your friendship group, your work 
friendship group as well, you know, all, all tied into that. Um, most of our apprentices, when, yeah, when they leave school and they get to know each other, we've got a Facebook group that they all join so they can chat to each other before they join. They start sharing information about who wants to get a house together, you know, we're going to get somewhere renting together. So they kind of, they already bond before they get there. So they, they become a really close unit and they support each other. And they, I think they socialize quite significantly with each other, not exclusively, but I mean, quite a lot with each other so that they they stay together and, and they stay part of that cohort. Because yeah, it's, it's so much juggling and you've, you know, you've got to find yourself somewhere to live. Whereas obviously if you just went to university, you just tip up at walls and, and that's where you'd be. Um, but remember, you're getting paid. So you've got yeah. the money to do stuff that you don't have if you're a student. So it's just it's just checks and balances all the way along. But I, I definitely think it's really important for, for students listening to this recording that they recognise it's a choice of a job. It's not a, just a, a cheap way to get a degree. Because if you only think of it like that, you won't you won't be able to stick at it. Yeah, I, I can I can understand that, but it's such a phenomenal opportunity. Yeah. I can imagine, and from what you're saying, there's a community of people that are also in the same position as you, so you can you can rely and and kind of build a strong network and support system of people that may understand what you're going through because they're going through it themselves. Yeah, exactly. And the university, you know, the, the, in both of those courses, there's a you know a student support tutor. So there is there are academic staff who are there to be supportive of your development as a student, uh, just as they would be if you're an undergraduate. And then in the Jaguar and Rover team, you know, we have a, a team within our learning academy who are cohort leaders of our apprentices who are there to support you. And you also have your line manager, who just like for any other employee, you have a strong relationship with your line manager who's there to support your um, performance, but also your well-being. So you do have those network groups as well as the informal cohort group. Um, so I, I absolutely want people to recognise that you would never feel cut adrift, but in, you also have to recognise that it's a tough choice. Okay, so the next section is stepping up. And this section is all about how people can build the resilience and deal with rejection and all those uncomfortable things that you have to go through when going through life-changing opportunities. My first question is all about imposter syndrome. So when you go into these new environments and you're the youngest on the team and you don't really know what's going on, it's all foreign to you, is there any advice you can give um, as to how they can deal with that kind of situation, Anne-Marie? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right to flag it. And it's particularly, we see it a lot on our apprenticeship. We see it less on graduates because they seem to be more of a level playing field, uh, perhaps in demographics and, and sort of experiences. With our apprentices, it, it is a real issue because we'll have some apprentices coming in to say our level three programme who are 16 years old, almost like bang on 16 years old, just straight out of year 11. And then other people, you asked me earlier about the age issue, there are no age limits. So you'll have other people who are 20 25, 26. Now that doesn't sound that many years difference, but when you're 16, yeah. someone who's 26 is, is just a different beast altogether. They're like a yeah. proper grown up and you're not. And the only other people that you've been used to dealing with of that type might be at school, you know, with teachers. So it's a very, very difficult balance to strike when you, when you first come into that environment. So I think absolutely there is an issue. Nobody should feel that they are not as good as the next person. You know, if you if you join our business, and I, I'm sure this would be the case for other employers, you know, you've been selected to join that company for good reason. And that's because you've got talent, you've got potential, you've got skills, and you've got the right motivation. And you should you have to keep reflecting on the fact they chose me, they selected me, they want me in their organization, and they want me to do well, and I've got something to offer. I've maybe got different things to offer than the people around me, but I still have a contribution to make. They're not need, they don't need to be an expert. I don't need to talk the most. I don't need to talk the loudest. But I do need to feel confident in myself because they've chosen me to do this job. And I think people just need to reflect on that and, and just accept that there, there will be just different personality types. And that's good. You know, the yeah. diversity and inclusion is more than just men, women, black, white. It's about people with different perspectives and bringing a different level of experience into that team. Um, yeah. And if you look around you and you think, oh my goodness, everyone's so much older than me, everyone's done so much more stuff than me. Well, so what? You've been brought in for your potential, not for what you've already done. 
No, I love that. And what about if a candidate is rejected during the interview process and they feel defeated? What would you suggest they do? Any advice? Well, firstly, I think candidates for early careers opportunities just need to recognise that they will get rejected from some it, it, and they will be disappointed. So just set yourself up almost for the fact that don't, not on a case by case basis, never go into something thinking, oh, I will get rejected from this, but just go into the whole endeavour thinking I will get some rejections in, in the next the course of the next few months. But always think as well that the right person gets chosen for the right job and that if an employer doesn't take you on well if they've done their job properly it's because you wouldn't be happy there if you don't yeah. have the right traits the right attributes the right alignment to that company then you you you, you might wish they'd given you the job but if they had given you the job you'd have probably been really unhappy and nobody succeeds when they're when they're struggling nobody succeeds when they're unhappy so it's just feel take solace in the fact that it was probably the right decision and you'll be much happier somewhere else no i love that uh, that thought that outlook because normally you feel that you've done something wrong and you're this huge failure and what you're actually saying is maybe it wasn't for you and maybe yeah. there's another opportunity that's best suited for you i love that so we're going to wrap up now and i know you're passionate about diversity in the workplace <laughs> <laughs> what steps are JLL taking to ensure that it's a diverse and inclusive workspace? Well, well, lots is the short answer. I think also it's it's um, really important, and I keep stressing this within our business that that addressing DNI, addressing diversity and inclusion to make your workforce a better balanced organisation is a very long long term initiative. It's not something that is going to be achieved overnight. Um, yes. And if you've got an organisation uh, where you do have imbalances, and we'll hold our hands up, you know, we're a manufacturing organisation, an industrial organisation, an automotive company. Um, we are ever increasingly becoming a cutting edge technology company. But in our industry, the male female balance, for example, is very imbalanced. So to, to get that back to a more 50 50 split, that's going to take a long time. But we are taking positive steps, positive action to make sure that we involve all of the people of diversity that we have in our organisation to make sure that when people come into an assessment or join an assessment, they look around them either virtually or face to face and see this is where I could belong. I would not feel out of place. There are people here like me because I think that sense of belonging is really important, both when you're joining an organisation and also when you're in it. Um, wow. But getting better DNI is a long-term project, and it involves painstaking work within schools, um, going into schools in the lower year groups, so like years years eight, nine, ten, and talking to those pupils about careers such as the engineering careers that we've just been talking about, and that these careers are for them. But you, yeah, you know, unless you unless you change start. minds, then you can't change. Yeah. You know, it's no point just waiting till they were at university. It's too late. Exactly. Yeah, it is too late, and that's what I was just going to say because you know at that younger age when you're in year seven or year eight you you're starting to look at the world differently you're starting to think could I do that later on when I'm older oh I'm quite inspired by this I would love to do this in the future or I'm seeing my uncle and I'm understanding he's doing this now and mm -hmm. my auntie's doing this and I'm becoming more in, you know inquisitive and excited about the world around me and I'm starting to understand how it's going to impact my future life so I do think wait until university when they decided the degree they're studying is is, is quite late to be honest yeah. um so yeah i agree with you on that are there any resources available to help um i mean on the jlr website to help with finding out more opportunities finding out what kind of stem careers are available yeah so start? The Jaguar Land Rover Careers website um, with our landing pages for all of our programs. We talk a lot about the type of work that we do, um, but and that's a really great starting point. And we talk about our educational opportunities for the sort of pre to so pre the early careers programs, the opportunities for work experience. We've got a virtual work experience opportunity coming up quite quite soon, um, and all of that would be on our website. But I'd say particularly. Is sort of key to us at the moment and, and has been now for a number of years is our social media presence. So okay. Jaguar Land Rover Early Careers on Facebook, Jaguar Land Rover Early Careers on Instagram. 
there. Students will find lots and lots of blogs and uh, profiles and discussions with our current employees, but our current young people in the business, talking to the, the outside world about the job that they do and why they love it. So I would say, yep, the website is great, but, but join us on social media because that is probably going to be your best way to really find out what we do and really get to, to hear people talk, or even if it's not literally hear people talk, read their blogs and read their reflections on their world and that would be really helpful to people to, to get a better picture of what we do great and that would be added in the show notes as well the, the ads and the links as well in case anyone wants to find out more information and marie i have thoroughly enjoyed this interview the work that's being done at jaguar land forever is phenomenal and i believe that there's so many great opportunities thank you so much for sharing um this with us today Hey, you're welcome. It's been really great to talk to you. Oh, and guys, thank you for listening to us. We hope this has been an informative piece and you feel inspired to check out what's happening at JLR. Please subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn at STEM Socials. And join us next time for our next episode of Stepping into STEM.